Next, we're going to talk about disorders of the prostate gland. So prostatitis is going to be a term that is used to refer to different types of inflammatory disorders of the prostate gland. And there's three uh, that are going to be listed that we're going to talk about. So acute bacterial prostitis is caused by an ascending infection from the urethra or reflex of infected urine into the ducts of the prostate gland. So this is typically going to be your E. coli, but it can also be Pseudomonas klebsiella or chlamydia. So signs and symptoms of this are going to be frequent or fever, urinary frequency, urgency, dysuria, and a dull aching pain in the perineum or the prostate gland. It can also be pain in the rectum or the back. The prostate becomes enlarged and it's painful upon rectal exam. Chronic bacterial prostatitis is going to be from recurrent UTI or stones in the prostate. And this is typically from E. coli, proteus, or Klebsiella. The signs and symptoms of this are going to be urinary frequency, urgency, dysuria, low back pain, and perineal comfort, discomfort. The chronic this one should say chronic prostatitis or chronic pain syndrome. This is going to be the most common type, but it's the least understood. It is thought to be related to pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. So there's two types of inflammatory processes believed to be happening here, and it's going to be from an autoimmune disorder, but the actual cause is unknown, and a non-inflammatory but that is also unknown. There's many that speculate about this, that it can be due to an obstruction of the bladder neck or uh, possibly outside of the prostate gland. Signs and symptoms of this are going to be low back pain, pain in the penis, testicles, scrotum, or rectum, and there's going to be no bacteria identified in the urine, but they do have abnormal inflammatory cells and the prostate secretions for the inflammatory type. So again, this one's going to be the most common. So prostatitis is going to be pretty difficult to diagnose. Urine and prostate secretions are generally examined and cultured to check for urine and blood cells, as well as bacteria. They can also perform x-rays and an ultrasound to visualize any pelvic structures, and they can give medications to treat this. So bacteria prostatitis is going to be treated with the appropriate antibiotic based off of a culture and this is a pretty long-term treatment plan it's going to take about four months to treat so they have a potential to relapse after antibiotics are finished I just as a side note I've seen patients be on antibiotics prophylactically for this but that's not very common so non-bacterial and chronic pelvic pain syndrome do not respond to any drug therapy so they can have relief from symptoms with NSAID treatments for pain and to relieve inflammation. But think about all the side effects that an individual can have for NSAIDs, and not everybody can take those. Anticholinergics may reduce voiding syndrome or yeah, voiding symptoms like the frequency, urgency, and dysuria. So some of these are going to be like your Ditropan, your Oxybutin, your Detrol, Vesicare. That relaxes smooth muscle and helps with spasms. Muscle relaxants are also used depending on the symptom severity. And you can use stress reduction activities like warm baths, avoiding of sitting for extended periods of time, and uh, guided imagery. There are just other things that help with that. Nursing care is going to focus on your symptom management. You can increase fluids up to 3 liters a day, increase your fiber, promote regular bowel movements, and that helps ease pain associated with bowel movements from this. Sitz baths can help relieve pain in the peritoneum or in the rectum, and it's very important that the patient finish all their prescription of antibiotics with this. This type of condition is not contagious. Then we have BPH, or benign prosthetic hypertrophy. The pathology of this is there's hormone changes in men as they age, and that makes the prostate more sensitive to the availability of DHT. And the estrogen appears to synthesize the prostate glands to the effects of the DHT. An increase in estrogen levels due to aging may, may contribute to this as well. 
So this begins with small nodules in the inner layers of the prostate, and enlargement occurs with inward growth that gradually compresses the urethra, leading to urologic symptoms associated with BPH, and this generally occurs gradually over time. Your risk factors here are you're going to be your typical preconditions, age over uh, 48, family history of this, and then right here, African American and Hispanic individuals are more likely to have BPH and then a diet high in fat and, and meats. Going back to the expanding tissue that progresses that compresses the urethra. This can cause a partial or even a complete obstruction of urine flow and a decrease in contractility due to muscle hypertrophy. So think about what happens with that. You're gonna have some urine retention. Your symptoms are gonna be urinary frequency, and an increased time to void, small stream, urgency, nocturia, overflow incontinence, and chronic urine retention. So a lot of times when these patients have to use the bathroom every five minutes, it's because their bladder's not emptying all the way. So they still have a lot of residual left in there. So complications from this can be bladder distension, dietic, my words are hard today, diverticular of the bladder wall from distension may develop, and then ureter obstruction, infection, and then renal insufficiency. With BPH, the first thing they're going to do is rule out any other causes because there's other issues that are a little bit more pressing that could be reversible. So with this, there's no way to reverse BPH. You're going to perform a digital exam on this, check their labs, you're going to look at their creatinine levels their UA for WBCs, RBCs, and bacteria, and then a urine residual. So what they're going to do is they're going to have these individuals void. They're going to measure how much urine output they have. Then they're going to bladder scan them. If they do not have to void again or they still feel like they have to go, um, what they're going to do is they're going to stop and they're going to catheterize them to see how much is left in the bladder and that is checking for urine residual. They're going to perform blood tests looking for PSA, that's the prostate specific antigen, and that's considered a reliable tumor marker for a prostate cancer. So they're really still ruling out other issues. And then they're going to ask their patient, the patient for any subjective information. So make sure you're complete communicating with your client, ask them if they feel as if though their bladder is emptying or if it's still full after voiding, uh, do they feel they have frequent need to urinate, and do they strain to urinate. So are they really trying hard to, uh, to get their drink stream started or keep it going? The treatment for this is going to be determined by the severity of manifestations and the presence of any complications. So if it's mild, they might just monitor over time, and if it's more severe, then they'll intervene. So with the antiantigens, that is going to be medications that are used to shrink the prostate. They may cause impotence and decrease the libido over time, and examples of this are going to be your ProScar and your Ativert. So they are only effective if the prostate is about 40 mils or greater in size. And really for, for nurses, nurses to use, need to use caution with administering this and not administer this medication if they're pregnant. This medication really can cause harm to male fetuses. So use caution if you are the nurse caring for this patient and you happen to be pregnant. All you need to do is ask another nurse to give that for you and they will understand. So the other one, the alpha androgenic antagonists, uh, that's going to be a lot of education with the family too. So you're going to have slow position changes to avoid dizziness and falls, monitor their blood pressure, and then check with the healthcare professional prior to taking any over-the-counter medications such as for cough, colds, or allergies because they, they can contain an androgenic agent. So this is going to relieve obstruction and increase flow by, of the urine by blocking smooth muscle contraction. And again, the side effects are going to be orthostatic hypotension, and that's going to be your cardera and your Flomax. And um, the other name for Flomax is Tamsulosin, but with Flomax, the way that I always teach people to remember that this is for BPH is it kind of makes your flow max. I, I don't know how else to remember it, but that seems to work for me. So if it's mild, at first they're going to treat with Proscar or the Ativert, 
and then uh, both the ProScar and the Carter together will be more effective than a, a single agent. So keep that in mind if your patient has manifestations that tend to progress over time. So there are some surgeries to help with this, but those are in the more extreme cases. So these are the men that have urinary retention with recurrent UTI, hematuria, or stones and that are going to be leading to renal insufficiency. So those are the ones that are going to be candidates for this. The minimally invasive surgery is going to be the transurethral urethral microwave thermotherapy, and that's going to heat and destroy the excessive prostate tissue. So during the procedure, a cooling system will protect the urinary tract, and this takes about an hour. The transurethral needle ablation is called a TUNA, T-U-N-A, and that is heat produced by radio frequency, and that burns away the area of the enlarged prostate, and this leaves uh, an area that helps improve the flow of urine through the urethra. And then we have transurethral surgery. So this is called a TERP, so transurethral surgery. And that stands for transurethral resection of the prostate. So this one's going to be a little bit more common. So this device is actually inserted through the urethra, and I know it looks pretty barbaric, but this is a lot less invasive than the way that they used to do things with open surgeries. So this involves removing the obstruction that, uh, of the tissue, and that is removed one piece at a time. So the tissue is flushed through the bladder with fluid and then flushed out at the end of the operation. So they're kind of, they're breaking it up in there, pushing it into the bladder, and then it gets flushed out and again a lot less invasive uh, than it used to be so you're going to be monitoring these patients for the first 24 to 48 hours after surgery and you're going to notify the physician if the patient has any signs of hemorrhage so decreased H&H &H, tachycardia hypotension and so on some of these patients will come out of the surgery with a TBI in place and I kind of mentioned that in the other um, lecture if you watch that one first. If you haven't watched it, make sure that you open that one up and go to the end and watch the video. Depending on the severity that your patient is experiencing, they also might possibly do a transurethral incision of the prostate, and that's where they're going to make small incisions where the prostate is attached to the bladder, and they split the gland, and that decreases the pressure within the urethra. So if they're doing that one, then you're not going to have any tissue removed, and there's less chance for post-op complications. So think back when we were talking about this and I said it's a lot less barbaric than what they used to do. Well, they still do an open prostatectomy, prostatectomy uh, when it's absolutely necessary, although I don't see it as often as I see the TURPs anymore. So TURP, T-U-R-P, is the most common one, and then uh, this would happen if if needed. So this is going to be done when the prostate is very large and they usually experience uh, ED for about three months after surgery. They can also be doing a retro pubic and that is going to be the preferred method and this really decreases the risk of ED. So a prostatectomy or a perineal prostatectomy or suprapubic. And there's going to be a lot more risk for bleeding because think about how much more invasive this surgery is versus this one. They could also be doing a laser surgery, and that's when a cystoscope is entered through the penis, through the urethra, and then into the prostate, and they use bursts of energy to, to um, get rid of that extra tissue. So there's going to be a lot less blood loss with that and more rapid recovery, and it's really not going to affect the prostate as much as these will. And then sometimes they also use stenting. So post-op care, you want to do your assessments, frequent vitals. So with post-op, again, it's going to be 15 minutes, every 15 minutes for the first hour, every 30 minutes for the second hour, and then Q2 hours, and then Q4. You're going to increase fluid intake, and that will reduce any burning discomfort and decrease the risk for UTIs. And a BNO suppository can help relieve bladder spasms. 
So TERP syndrome, that's going to be caused by the absorption of irrigating fluids during and after the surgery, and if it's untreated, it can lead to seizures and arrhythmias. May also decrease hematocrit, hypertension, bradycardia, nausea, and confusion. And then patient may also have the three-way you're getting fully. That's called the CBI again. And then uh, sometimes wit traction is going to be applied to that. So CBI and Foley are usually removed within 24 to 48 hours following a TERP procedure. Although if they have a lot of hematuria, they're going to keep that going to reduce clots. And there's a different picture of it there. Actually, that might be the same picture. So your nursing responsibilities with these, you're going to check the flow frequently. This is not something I would delegate to a CNA. This is something that you really need to be monitoring carefully. You're going to change the irrigation solution as needed. So these bottles, again, are 3,000 mils. or three. They're quite large, and usually you will have two hooked up at the same time and then two ready to go. So you're going to order these these boxes for this. Um, when you go to empty the catheter, it's best to get, order a bucket from Central Supply because you really, the urine amount that's in here combined with the fluid, it's going to be too much to use a bladder liner. Um, of course, wear your gloves. And you're going to compare the INO. That's very important. So whatever you're measuring out here, again, I usually use a bucket. Make sure that you measure it and subtract this amount of fluid. Epic does a really nice job of doing that for you, but I always just like to double check it. So if the solution is not returning, irrigation may be necessary, and that is done manually. So what you would do is you would... Uh, you would unplug the Foley catheter at the at the port site and you would manually irrigate with a syringe. Other things to consider, I don't know if I mentioned this in the other PowerPoint, but the part that goes into the patient, like right before the, the, the actual Foley part, is a three-way catheter. So they are quite thick. They look kind of intimidating but the patient is sedated when they are put in uh, in surgery. So one lumen is used to drain the urine. Another one is used to inflate the catheter balloon, just like you would see with a traditional flow fully. And then the final lumen, lumen carries the irrigation solution into the bladder. And this is primary, primarily used in genital urinary surgery, but I've seen it used with other things too. You want the color on this to be light pink or colorless and that prevents the formation of blood clots. So some of your signs of obstruction are going to be no urine, of course, so if you don't have any urine coming out, no fluids are coming out of the bag. The urine is frank and bloody, many clots, and uh, bladder spasms. That's going to be the other thing. So when you're assessing these patients, if you think that it's not flowing in, you're going to, you're going to empty the bag, and you should be seeing like a constant drip coming out, depending on how fast this is going. And the uh, the other thing is, is they'll have some kind of overflow urine that's coming out of the tip of their penis because the bladder is so full, it's just kind of spasming and coming out. But with those patients, you can make sure that you bladder scan them, and it'll show that they've got a lot of urine in there. So urine characteristics, you're going to see them here. This one's quite dark. You're going to have light red to dark red, and that is normal the first day of surgery. What you don't want to be in there is blood clots. So very dark red is going to indicate increased uh, venous bleeding or inadequate dilution. So the catheter, if it gets to be that dark red, it's going to be at risk for occlusion. So you're going to increase the flow rate, and you just do that on the... Um, the stopper itself. So that video does a pretty good job of showing you that. Bright red may indicate arterial bleeding and increase the flow of the CBI, monitor vitals, and notify the MD immediately if that happens. I would not probably leave this patient for very long um, to do that. You could even call from, from the room. Contains blood clots. An occasional blood clot is normal, and depending on the size of them, they may not be a problem. Some of them are quite small, but if it's getting large, you want to make sure that you increase the rate of the CBI to keep it flowing. And then clear to light pink, that's what you want to see. That would, that's what your goal is. 
nursing diagnosis, they're going to have some deficient knowledge there. Educate your patient that they will have a catheter in the bladder for up to three days after surgery, but typically it's 24 to 48 hours. Again, I've seen it longer than that. And then upon the removal of the catheter, they're going to have some frequency and urgency, and you really want to increase fluid and take and educate them on how to do Kegel exercises. Urinary retention, teach them how to double void, and that's when they're going to void, wait three to five minutes and void again. And avoid intake of large volumes of liquid at one time. So you kind of want to space it out so they're, they're not drinking a gallon of water all at once. Uh, risk for infection, monitor temp, WBC, cow, and pulse. And then risk for imbalanced fluid volume, so monitor vitals, BP, pulse monitor color of urine and the urine drainage bag, and then after the Foley is removed, continue to do that. I, I would tell my patients if they're voiding in the urinal to not flush that, um, put the urinal at the bedside, have them use it there. That way you can at least see what it looks like before it gets dumped in the, in the commode. And then just, again, make sure you watch that CBI video if you haven't done so already.